Good morning, Tallahassee. It's time to wake up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hajavanti and Corey Clark. Oh, yeah, man. I'm Aslan. He's Corey. It's Wake Up War Chan. Thursday edition of the program. Game glad, day. Glad to be here. Yeah, it is game day. We're going to talk a lot about basketball today, I promise. It's 16 hours away from when, when you're listening to this, the game will start. I think tomorrow or later tonight could potentially be, this will be like the worst day possibly of my life in Tallahassee since we lost to Florida in 2004. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Just doing the show... Well, you know, going to have to stay up tonight, Yeah, watch the game, do this show, then go right and go do uh, the, the football, football thing. Yeah. I mean, God, come on, man. Nobody, nobody's going to want to hear us complaining. No we got pretty cool jobs, but yes, it's a, it's, it's a, bit, it's a bit, uh, bit much this week. A lot, a, lot of go, a lot going on. You know what would make my day better is if I had uh, a tasty bite from one of the three great locations um, from For the Table Hospitality over in the College Town District that includes Central, Mass, and Social, and Township. That would put a smile on my face. I assume at least one of those will be open uh, for the game tonight. A little watch party action with people. Uh, Get loose. People watching I'd the say game. probably Mad So if I had to, if I had to guess. I'd say yep. Mad So probably. Probably. game's going to probably start at, after 10 at least. So... Uh, you got plenty of time to get, you know, nice and lubricated. Well, I think it, it has like a 10 15 start time. Yeah, so period. That means probably 10 25. Yeah. So they're well, going to, even if they get bounced, they'll be one of 13 teams left. It's a cool way to finish your season. The, the Titan 13. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. I feel good about it. We will have a Dallin Cuff from ESPN joining us in the second segment of the program. Uh, kind of break things down, maybe from the Gonzaga perspective, give us some uh, intel and whatnot. Uh, he's a national analyst, uh, studio analyst, also does color analyst uh, work for them. Does a lot of analyst stuff, kind of like um, all the guys at Alabama. All hey. right, so spring football one day in the books. They're, are, are they off today or are they just not letting us out there today? I think they're off. Okay, they're off. And then Friday they'll be back at it. We'll be back at it. Everybody can go back at yep, it. Yep, we'll all the fans public. can go out there, yeah. All right, so you want to give us something? Or first of all, let's talk about your column and then maybe some stuff that you weren't able to fit into your column. Uh, the crux of it was basically, it's a beautiful day. <laughs> Trying to make a little Bono there, maybe? I mean, it's the first football practice in Florida State history where DMX was played at, at least, right? Has to be. Can't even think of another chance that that would have happened. Uh, yeah, no, uh, you know, it's just different. We don't know if it's going to be better. Um, we can all have our opinions on it and whether this is how you should coach a team or not coach a team. I, I don't, I guess the downside when you, when you watch and you were there Aslan, and there were a few hundred people that watched it, it, it goes really fast. That, that seemed like a fast practice. Um, and they speed around everywhere. They're, they're getting reps and reps and reps. And it does seem like it's, uh, yeah, more fun, obviously, but also, you know, more lighthearted, not as serious. That can be a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, you got to coach, you got to teach, you got to do it. You got to want them to do do things the right way. But like Willie said during his introductory press conference on Tuesday, they do most of their coaching and teaching in the film room. That's what he wants to do. He wants them to just go fast on the practice field and then they correct on uh, in the film. So I want to go fast. So uh, you know, but it is it is remarkably I, you. I don't know that you could – what else could you do to be more different than what it used to be? Like, I, I can't envision what it could be to be any more different than the way it was the last eight years. Was it just like a quiet, Except miserable for Jimbo, walking on eggshells? Jimbo screaming. Literally, when you would walk, because you couldn't see it, we couldn't go in. You would walk back and forth. Uh, Valoria would be shouting. You'd have some GA shouting. But during the practice, it was a whole lot of Jimbo screaming. That's it. I mean, you know how his voice says It carries. It shrieks. This this sweet. practice started voice. with Simple Man, ended with DMX. You had Guns N' Roses in there, Metallica. Uh, what was the worst song you think they played <clears> yesterday? Man, one of the country songs. I, it, what, like the third, two of the first three or three of the first four were country songs. There was one I'd never heard of that was like, oh, oh, oh and uh, Cherry Pie. Yeah, I was that's, a, that's Cherry that's, Pie that's, from Warren. I, that was a weird. That's a weird. Uh, weird addition to the playlist to have. She's my Cherry Pie, but you can tell they cultivated it to be. 
more like maybe perhaps family friendly at first, and then people would probably start filing out, and then towards the end of it, it was much more. I would assume the week of the and I and I'm I am interested to see if it what's it what it's going to be like, like a Tuesday in October. Is it still going to be that kind of right. lively and and um, spirited and fun? When everyone's banged up and if bruised you're four and, and one, and yeah. is the music going to matter? Is he going to have a dance party then too? If you're two and three or four and two or whatever it is, uh, I'm, I am interested in that. But for the spring, anyway, this seems like a perfect way to conduct a practice to me. Yeah, you know, I don't want to blow his cover, but you know, Gene Williams, the founder of AdministrativeWarchant dot com, yeah, he just had this look of wonderment and amazement and astonishment on his face. I mean, like a little kid almost. I mean, Gene was just. He was looking around at guys celebrating. There was a, a really nice touchdown pass that James Blackman hit to Maury and Terry on. And, you know, six guys mob him. They're jumping up and down and celebrating. David Kelly's, like, in the fray. And Gene is just like... Taggart did, too. Taggart went and yeah. chest bumped, yeah. Gene just like, Jimbo would have lost his mind. I'm like, really? If He's like, absolutely. Oh, yeah. 100%. And I'm like, really? 100%. Get, get your asses back to the... And get in line. We're we're running another rep. What are y'all doing? Like that's yeah. what it would have been. Again, this would not to say one works and the other one doesn't. Jimbo has a ring. Willie Taggart doesn't. So Jimbo's style is proven to work. I think this is for what this program just went through for the last eight years. Certainly the last two. It's a perfect antidote to it, man. I I just think it couldn't. You couldn't have asked for anything better to get. The, like Marvin Alt Wilson said, it makes him love. He was only here for a year. Um, with Jimbo makes him love last year felt like a job and it makes him love playing football again. If you can do that, if you can reach these kids and make them love the sport and not have it be so much of a grind, cause it is such a grind. If you can make it a little more fun, I just feel like the results will take care of themselves. What is in this a tough game played by tough people? Well, exactly right. So have fun when you can dance, have fun when you can. The games are serious yeah. and the practices are going to be serious in the fall. And they're going to be serious in the spring, but you, you got to have energy, and you got to have you 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 want them to enjoy to come out there. If it's a grind, anything you do, like this show, if this was a grind, if I hated to do it, you you could tell. Like right now, I think people can tell. Man, Corey just does not like what he's doing. <laughs> he's angry. So I mean, uh, I just think that's any walk of life, man. You, if you if you enjoy what you do and you have an enthusiasm for it, typically you're going to be better at it. Listen, there and there was nothing that made me think that this was a amateurish production. Like there was yeah. nothing, it, the, the it was fun, honed. it was well yeah, honed. Yeah. The, the fun of it wasn't unorganized uh, daycare for, you know, teenage right. kids or and whatever. And it wasn't at the expense of teaching and, and running drills. Yeah. So you can find a balance. And, and again, I mean, you know, Marvin Wilson, you know, made the comments that you referred to. Um, I just kind of been curious to see guys like you know Cam Akers was you know was asked by Tim Lennon, you know how cool is it to have a coach like uh, Willie who's a uh, you know has a running back background? It's like yeah, that's cool. You can guess where we all want to go, and it's just you know it's like there's some guys that came here uh, to 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 get here to go to the pros because yeah, it's of a three year pit stop, yeah. you know. So most wonder, of them, and I wonder how those guys are going to take to it. But I guess at the end of the day, man, when you're 21 years old, uh, even if you have the NFL on your rear view, you know, immediately after three years. Is it going to be that bad if you're having fun while you're practicing? I mean, I, I guess at the end of the day, as long as you're getting your reps and your touches come Saturdays in the fall, you, you'll be happy all And you wonder how much fun it really is because it's still hard. I mean, those guys oh. were breathing heavy. I mean, they were getting after Dude, it. The they offensive were line was doing like weird bear crawl. Oh, man, they, like, it, yo, wasn't, oh it wasn't all just a party. It wasn't like a Chuck E. Cheese party. I mean, they were having – it was a real practice, and there was a lot of sweat and a lot of grunts. So I don't know if it's going to necessarily be fun practices, but they will be more enjoyable. That makes and sense. I, you know what I mean? And, and I think that will pay off, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see in the next three years what this football program does and how many wins it has, but it's certainly going to be a lot different. And there was one part of the practice we weren't allowed to film, but I think it was some sort of special teams thing that was going on towards the far field that's closer to Stadium Drive. Right. But like, pads were popping. Yeah. I mean, they were – it was physical with an F. Mike Singletary <laughs> likes to F, say. Yeah, that's exactly what he right. likes to say. With an F U. Yeah, so there's no there's no softness going on out there. Well, we'll run some sort of comments and, and statements from Coach Taggart uh, later on the program. There's some things I wanted to touch on that he said that I think alleviates some of my, you know, my nitpicky stuff that people don't enjoy when I talk about Willie. Uh, there was something he said that really, um, you know, kind of put a smile on my face in terms of like, all right, I can buy into sort of that stuff. So uh, we'll get into plenty more spring football discussion, but let's step aside for a break. There's 16 teams competing for our nation's championship in collegiate basketball. 
Florida State happens to be one of them. We'll tune and turn our attention to the worldwide leader and have uh, their perspective on things. Right after this here on Wake Up War Chant, ESPN 97.9 Tallahassee. You're locked in to Wake Up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Oh, man, feels good in the bones, doesn't it, Corey? I see you tapping your foot over there. Welcome back to the program, folks. It's Wake Up War Chant right here on ESPN 97.9 Tallahassee, brought to you by For the Table Hospitality and their three great locations over in the College Town District, Central, Madison Social, and Township. Three good options if you want to go check the Knolls tonight. 10-15, L.A. We got boots on the ground with Irish O'Fell, but uh, we've got the opinion of a guy who uh, knows a little thing or two about basketball. Dallin Cuff from ESPN joining us here to break down the uh, – the remaining 16 teams in the field. Dallin, how are you, man? Thanks for being here. How about that in-bump music real quick? Boys Tr- to men? Try was, was, homo- was that an homage to the fact we've known each other since I was like 14 years old? Is it was. Doing right there? It was. I wasn't going to try to say that like I, uh, I called in a favor of a friend. I was going to try to say that like this show had so much cachet that we can pull guys from Bristol now. But yeah, pretty much. Just want to <laughs> you know, tip my cap to you, man. So uh, thanks for being That's here, man. Tremendous. I appreciate it. Great tune, great tune. Good we, stuff, man. Great to be here, man. Uh, so, so many things happened, obviously, in the first weekend that were just so crazy, whether it was the um, the game-winning shot Michigan had, obviously, a UMBC taking down Virginia the first time a, a one-seed falls to a 16. Where does Florida State uh, taking down Xavier and being one of the 16 teams left in this tournament kind of rank, or and how, do you, how do you kind of size that up? Uh, it's a big it's, – it's, it's no doubt a big upset. I mean uh, – that said, I mean, Xavier, I thought, was the weakest of the one seeds. Um, I was really confident Florida State would win that first game because Missouri, come back Michael Porter Jr. when he came back, the, the struggle they had at the end of the season, they, they just weren't right. And Florida State's a team that more, Missouri doesn't have much depth. Florida State ran people at them. They turned them over. They, they, they struggled. And I thought that Xavier, who they've had issues with turnovers. You watch those two DePaul games early in the year. They turned the ball over a lot, almost, almost left DePaul at home and on the road, which is the worst team in the Big East. I thought there was a chance Florida State could do it. I was surprised. Don't get me wrong, because when it was twelve minutes, when it was what a twelve point game, about eight minutes to go. Yeah, I, I was I was semi dozing off there. I thought we were pun- I was punting. I was like, all right, let me go back to Marshall and WVU. I thought that was over. Did you take the uh, sharpie got, out? This, I'm not. I'm not Seth Davis. There was no sharpie. <laughs> um, but I did. I, I thought we were done, and then they got on that run. So that was. It's up there. It's, it's a surprising one. If it wasn't a year where we had the South Region with UMBC and Nevada in total chaos then that, that upset would get more love. But it, it, it's, it's really not that. In terms of talent and depth, Florida State's got it. It's just can you put it together and can they make shots? And at times they turn you over, then it's a whole different story. But when they make threes, they can beat anybody. If they turn over, turn you over and make threes, that, that they can literally beat anybody in the country. Down Cup from ESPN joining us here on Wake Up or Chant ESPN 97.9 Tallahassee. Uh, so the next obstacle in their way is a Gonzaga team. Four seed? Corey, are they a four seed or a five? I can't even. I think they're a five, right? Four. They're, they're, four. they're four. They beat a they're five. Four. Yeah, Ohio State was That's the right. Five. Yeah, yeah. should have known that. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does Florida State, I guess, the strengths of this team is obviously, you know, going fast tempo and not. They can't By the really way, run. why would you ask me? You have the expert on. Oh, why trying why to incorpor- would you ask me the Incorporating seat? you into the show. I don't know because you usually so keep I'm 0 for one now. So, sorry. <laughs> we'll figure out a way to, to get the batting average up. Uh, but, you know, this Gonzaga team, in terms of their strengths, I mean, how does it, I guess, kind of juxtapose against what Florida State brings to the table? Florida State was able to, you know, like you mentioned, turn uh, Xavier over a bunch. And when Florida State can kind of get running, that's when they're at their best. They're not very good in the half-court set. So, I guess, you know, us here in Tallahassee, we're wondering how will that kind of match up or, uh, um, you know, line up against what Gonzaga is going to roll out uh, later tonight. Well, that's a good point because, I mean, that's a, the, the key point for them, and I've said this all year, is turnovers. They're this The Gonzaga, they, they can be real loose with the ball. And this is a team that has tremendous balance uh, on the offensive end and defensive end. They've got guys that have been there before, uh, whether it's Josh, Josh Perkins, Silas Melson, obviously this team went to the national championship team last year. Jonathan Williams, those guys played in that game and were impactful in that game. Uh, but you add in Killian Tilly, who's a sophomore, who's a stretch four man that can knock down threes. Uh, this Rui Hachimura is a redshirt sophomore. He's from Japan. They're doing the pro. Like, this guy's an NBA player right now. He can, he'll be able to play in the league whenever he wants. His development over the last six months has been unbelievable. He's got length. He's got athleticism. can knock down 18-foot jump shots, get to the rim. Um, but all that said, this team can get in this weird spot where they turn the ball over real loose with it. And, and that's the issue. It's, and we were talking about the other day. We've talked about it since December, honestly, up in Bristol on set all the time. Like, love Gonzaga, but their Achilles heel is they can be loose with the ball. And if that's the case, against a team like Florida State that will run eight, nine, ten guys at you that have length, that have athleticism, if, as you've already said, if they can get out in transition, 
that really helps their offense, and that makes things a lot easier. So for Gonzaga, they need to take care of the ball, and then they need to make this a half-court game. If they can make it a half-court game, they are efficient on both ends of the floor, and they are balanced on both ends of the floor. They can make Florida State pay for being, being in that pace. If Florida State can turn them over and speed them up and make them play a little quicker, and again, if Florida State is making threes, they're, they're a team that really they are, they are tough to deal with. So if you can do those things, they can win that game, but that's really hard to do. I've been Zaga going to lead eight and have them losing to Michigan in a really tight game with two teams that are actually really similar in how they approach the game and how they defend and how they play offense. So it, it, that, that's a game that I think is going to happen. But Florida State could upset the apple cart purely because they can do something that, that Gonzaga has had a problem with all year, which is turn you over. Dallin, Florida State fans, they, they never really get the ones that are basketball fans anyway. They don't get that concerned about big guys because, you know, Leonard Hamilton always has length and always can defend the rim pretty well. And he's got, a, he's got an incredible shot blocker as a freshman. I don't know how much he's going to play this in this game. How does Gonzaga shoot the three? Because that's what petrifies Florida State fans, because their defense is susceptible to giving up a ton of threes. Well, uh, they shoot it well. They Uh-oh. shoot it about thirty. Yeah, they shoot about thirty-seven percent for the year, which is. Um, and they have multiple guys that can shoot it, right? Yeah, I mean Zach Norvell Jr. He's a, another redshirt freshman. He's really shot it well as of late. He had a huge game last game. But the problem that you're going to find right now is they're big to step out and shoot threes. So. Yeah. As you just mentioned, they have some bigs that will protect the rim, but they're going to pull those guys away from the rim. Jonathan Williams can make an 18-19 footer. He can shoot out the three-point line. They like him a couple feet in. Killian Tilly, the sophomore from France, he'll, he can absolutely shoot three-pointers. When he'll, they'll step him out, and, and he'll knock down threes. And there's going to be a number of guys that can stretch the floor. Perkins, Melson, all the guys that are the guards. So Corey Kisport, the freshman that comes off the bench. Everybody on their team can dribble, pass, and shoot, which is a rarity in college basketball these days. It's actually – the antithesis of Florida State a lot. Florida, Florida State has a lot of athleticism, a lot of length, and some guys that can make shots, but not every guy there is that skilled. Gonzaga has a bunch of skilled dudes, particularly at their big spots. So that's, that's going to be a problem. That's, again, why if they have to play a half-court game, they being the Seminoles, they're in trouble. They have to make this an up-and-down game so their athleticism and their length can come into play and their ability and transition and some of their, some of their skill, the skill delta they have between them and Gonzaga can be mitigated because Gonzaga has guys that can, that can just flat out play basketball at any pace of the game. Did he just say the skill delta has to be mitigated? The guy went to Columbia, man. Holy moly, what are we doing here? He went to Columbia. <laughs> yeah, my, I, I got to play into my own stereotype I built for myself. I couldn't play that well, but I was supposed to be kind of smart, so I got to play that angle, guys. I don't think our listeners are used to that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of uh, verbal it, assault. We're bringing it, man. <laughs> So, Dallin, one of the weird things right now with Florida State is arguably their best player is coming off the bench every night in, in Trent Forrest. And I think there's a lot of people that are pointing to the fact that Florida State is able to roll out so many bodies and they have a, a 10-11 man rotation that's, I guess, wearing some teams down. I don't know if that's exactly the case, but that seems to be the prevailing wisdom. I mean, for you, does it differ by team? Is it best just to have a small rotation of guys coming off the bench, or do you think Florida State's ability to send guys out in waves has worn teams down like Missouri and Xavier in the second half of games? If you play to your strength, and their strong, their strength is their depth. They have they don't have a lot of there's not a lot of distance between five and ten in their team, and a lot of change between each position. There are very a lot of similar guys with similar skill sets that can do similar things, and that's a good thing. So you play into that. You don't you don't need to be a short bench. You don't need to be Duke where you only play six or seven because you got you got five pros. You want to play your pros. Uh, that's a little different animal to deal with. Florida State plays into their strength. They have disc, they have length, they have athleticism, they have depth, and that's kind of how Leonard Hamilton has built. Leonard Hamilton has built this program over years. And there's nothing, no reason to hide from that. Embrace that. And to your point, can you wear teams down? Absolutely, you can wear teams down. Missouri was a good example of that. They only play about seven deep, and those dudes they have one guard, and guys hurt his hand in that game, his wrist or whatever, and he he couldn't really. And he he's not strong with the ball to begin with, but they exploited that in terms of wearing those guys down. Xavier. I'm not sure they wore Xavier down as much as their athleticism took over, and Xavier they had been had a propensity to be sloppy with the ball, and that that was an Achilles heel all year, and it, and it bit them at the wrong time. And I think we saw that. Now, when you look at Gonzaga, it can be the same thing, but you have to play to your personnel. And that's what Leonard Hamilton does. His personnel is what it is. He embraces that. He utilizes that, and that's an advantage for them. They have to try to take advantage of that. The problem with the Gonzaga is they also have good depth and again a good skill level. So it's hard to just. Turn it on. You have to. You have to try to wear them down over a course of time. I would be surprised if he tried to press Gonzaga. That's something that they've done in the past. Uh, not so much this year, but in years past, they've been very successful playing 94 feet, speeding teams up, getting into them. 
I would be surprised if they did it just because they also have depth and they have ducks. They've got guys that can, that can break you down um, and, and make the right pass at times. Um, but if they, if they get the pinch, if they get down, I, that could be a, something he goes to because, as I've said 15 times already, they can turn the ball over. So if you want to try to speed them up, you can, again, use your depth to an advantage. The only problem that that's too, though, last part of that is that's better to utilize on the second night of a tournament, when you, when, of the tournament, when you're playing Thursday, Saturday, Friday, Sunday. Harder to prepare for. Teams are a little bit worn down. You've been on the road for four days. It's different. When you're coming into this game, the first Sweet 16 game, it's a little different. You've been home for four days. You've been preparing for four days for this team. Your practice schedule has been reflective of that. It's a different mind- mindset. It's a different uh, a physical approach to the game than it is the second day of the tournament weekend. Yeah, this is more of a ma- – you mentioned Leonard, and this is more of a macro question than a micro win. Just – Ooh, look at you, Corey. Big words. I'm yeah. not sure what either one like of those it, means. Like it. I'm not sure what either one of those <laughs> means. Um, but – just looking at his program as a whole, um, you know, I don't know how much you're familiar with the Florida State fan base and what it is, but there, he's a very polarizing coach, and I'm of the opinion that he's done a pretty nice job here, considering some of the uh, hurdles that he has to overcome and the obstacles. Not a great job, but a pretty good job. But I guess just this season as as a whole, he loses three guys that are now in the NBA, uh, loses four starters overall. And then gets this team to the Sweet 16, beating the team that housed them last year in the tournament. What does that say about where this program is and what he's done with it? And what do you think maybe the ceiling can be for a program like Florida State? It's funny. Right in the beginning part of your question, I kind of shrugged. Like, are you serious with this right now? They lost three pros, yeah. three NBA players, before two of them before anybody thought would leave. Like, that, 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 you know, Jonathan Isaac, nobody thought. I didn't think, at least when he first showed up on campus, that he was going to leave right away. I thought he had some more seasoning to do. Like there, like that was that's a, when you, any any program in the country, with the exception of Duke, Kentucky, used to be North Carolina, not anymore. It might be those two can 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 endure that type of loss and have a bounce back year. But again, that's a testament to his depth, how he's recruited, the depth of talent he's recruited, and how he deploys that talent. He's done a fantastic job. I mean, this is. This is not an easy gig when you lose pros. There aren't that many floating around in college basketball, especially when they leave early. So I think he's done a fantastic job. I think he's, he's literally embraced exactly how he wants to run his program. He's going to give 10 guys a shot, and guys like that. That's why you guys have players that are 8, 9, and 10 that are better than other 8, 9, and 10 guys on other ACC rosters because the guys know, okay, if I come here, I'm going to chance to hoop. I'm playing 20 minutes a night. And if I play well, maybe I get to 25, but maybe I don't get to 30. It's not how we do it but I'm still going to play, and I'm still going to have an impact on this game. I can have 20 off the bench. I can have 10, nothing off the bench, but I can still be part of the game. That doesn't happen everywhere, and I think he, he embraces that. It's a, it's a good culture he's got going on down there, and I think he's done a really good job, especially given what they lost last year. I never thought this team would be in the Sweet 16, especially, especially when they perform in the ACC tournament. When they lost that opening game, I was like, this team doesn't look like they really have it right now. They did, they did not look like they wanted to get out there, and they, they had something to play for. They thought they were already in the tournament. They were kind of in coast mode, and it's hard to switch it on. I was wondering what we were going to see once we hit the NCAA tournament. I think mean, they got a good matchup in Missouri, and they jumped on them, they dominated them, and I think they, they saw that number one next to Xavier, and they had, okay, let's get up. They got up for this game, and there's a lot of talent on this team, and they got up for that game, and they won that game. Dallin Cuff from ESPN joining us here on Wake Up War Chant, breaking things down with the Knowles and Gonzaga. Man, we'll keep our fingers crossed that we can get you on here next week uh, as we hopefully go to the Alamo. We preview the Final Four. Yeah. yeah. That is nice. <laughs> match up with Kentucky. Sure. That's going to happen. If they go to the Final Four, guys, 100% I'm on. You just give me a call. We'll do that. Check Thanks. them out on Twitter, folks. Uh, Dallin Cuff, D-A-L-E-N. You guys know how to spell Cuff. So, Dallin, thanks for your time, man. We appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, man. No problem. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, man, there you go. That's a guy uh, who knows his stuff, has some pretty good things to say about the program. Um, we'll discuss that further, uh, but let's get back to football perhaps as well. Let's step aside for a break. We'll be right back after this is Wake Up War Chant, ESPN 97.9 Tallahassee. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.
Is this your way of, like, getting back into the good graces of the country music crowd? Well, no. I mean, I, it's kind of kind of goes with the uh, Willie Taggart eclectic mix at the the practice. It wasn't all DMX. So there's a method to the madness of the music selection you were telling me at practice the other day. Uh, yeah, I talked to the guy. I guess he's a manager. I should have probably asked him his name and what he did, but it, I was too cold. Um, but he said that Willie Taggart gives him a theme for the day. And then he goes and meet the the guy, not Willie Taggart. The guy then goes and meets with a musical therapist. I assume they have a bunch of them on campus. I, I don't I don't quite know what that would entail, that job, but I, I assume there's some on campus. And they they devise a, a playlist of about 130 songs. And so, then they call it down from there? They I guess they call it down. There's no way he played 130 yeah. songs. But he said that that playlist was 130 songs. And uh, I think he just has it on a random. I don't okay. think it's in a set order. Uh, you got it, though. I think that's, I mean, if you're going to go that to that degree of having a musical therapist, I feel like every song leads to it. You know, like you got to keep think, building yeah. the emotion. You can't just, just you know. Hurt yeah, but maybe they did. Around. I might be completely wrong. Yeah. Maybe I just misheard them. Uh, the program brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. Three locations, College Town, Central, Madison Social, and Township. So with my uh, four eyes of mine, the two that I was born with and the two that the glasses give me, you know, I just kind of want to look at some guys, size them up, you know, see what they would, you know, kind of use my x-ray vision, imagine what they would look like shirtless, you know. Could have got oh, shirtless photos, okay. but tick, 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 yeah. ticks them in the mind. Tick, 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 tick. Fair. Landon Dickerson, I think to man, me. You ball, you're all about man, it. Yeah, I was all about Yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Andrew Carp is like my uh, baseball fan club guy I'll start. Landon Dickerson is the football fan club guy I'll be the president for. Yeah. That guy is going to probably be responsible for a lot of yards uh, that Cam Akers will be running behind. That dude, I mean, he, he tore his ACL, did he not? Like at one point in the, in the middle of the season. So the fact that he, and he was out there running with, I think, maybe the second team. I don't even know if the first team was really delineated. I think the first team that I, I could have seen in terms of offensive line. Yeah, it wasn't because Williams was out there at right tackle. Juwan, sometimes. And then Ball was out there yeah. sometimes. I mean, they were they were doing some heavy rotation. Eberly, I don't think, was out there at no. all or much. He, he did some snaps when they were doing one-on-ones, receivers on – uh, DBs, right. and then he would just snap to the quarterback to make the throw. But yeah, he was over with the uh, the mash unit that had like Carlos Becker, Emmett Rice, George Campbell. Um, that reminds me of a, a quick difference, not just musically. Um, one of, when they were doing the, I think it was just, I think it was, I don't know what it was. It was ones versus ones, but I'm not sure what the if it was. I think it was like the whole offense against like four defenders. Anyway, they were just basically the quarterbacks were getting reps, making quick reads, in there was a, twice in a row Francois was out there, and the snap came out at a million miles a, ma- at a, a mi- miles an hour over his head. And typically, like Jimbo last year, if that happened, he'd blow his whistle, he'd curse, and he'd say, do it again. And the same people would go out there, snap it till they got it right. This time, nope. The number ones were already running on the, f- on the other side of the field, yeah. and they had just lost their turn. Like, that's how it worked. It wasn't stop until you do it, do it right. It was, nope, you're done. The ones are already in full sprint to their side of the field to do their snap. That's a good incentive. Yeah, you want to well, play. Yeah. You want to be playing. You don't want to be on the sideline. Also, he's not stopping to yeah. correct and do it again when they're running that many people in there. It's a rhythm and it's a routine, and you get that one snap, and then that other, the other group is already running on the field. Yeah, so Landon Dickerson and the offensive line, um, interchangeable parts moving around. I think you know Willie said it's an organizational chart. When I asked him about yeah, depth, depth chart, he said yeah. it's an organizational thing. and I, It sounded like he deferred – to seniority here at first. He, you know, he's kind of the guys who've been here longer will be the guys that'll be out there. Because I think the first team offensive line, if I remember right, it was Ball and Kelly and then Minshew, and I forgot who else was the other guard, but then it was Corey Martinez actually taking the snaps right. at center. So it wasn't Baby on. And it's so funny, like there was a guy on the sideline who was Kelly a fan. Was, in guard. was he? Yeah, left I saw, guard. I, I saw him at left guard for a little bit. Yeah, they kept flipping him around. I mean, he's, he's that one of those swing guys. There was a guy next to me, a fan, like a student that was like, man. Wait till Bavion Jensen gets in there. Guys, like, yeah, he's like, oh, dude, Bavion's so much better than everybody else they have at center. I'm like, really? Like, I mean, like, he's not even out there right now. We I mean, even, we'll see. We'll see. People so, going by high school film. I mean, he might be. He might end up being great, but it hadn't been proven yet. Yeah. So receivers, though, that was another position that I, I think most of us had our eye on. Keith Gavin's another guy that just, I mean, come on, he just, he looks the part. I think if it's listen, just run fast in a straight line. Uh, run 15 yards, 
do a dig route. You know, just like do a square and just do something simple. Like don't, I don't need you to read the, the linebacker and see if they're going to drop into cover three or if they're coming with a blitz. Just this is the route, run it. The ball will probably be there. Right. I feel like production from him will be uh, much more robust this time around. And but I told you, I think man. just the way they re- run that offense, the swing from side to side with screen passes, DJ Matthews might catch 80 or 90 balls this year they, if he stays healthy. They want to get him the ball in space, which is a novel concept because he's a he's just one of those natural dudes that can make people miss. He he's has something in him. Shake. Um, and I think he's going to have seven, eight catches a game sometimes. But he's, he And he's going to make some big plays. Is there going to be, I don't want to say growing pains, but is it going to take a while to have uh, the Taggart taste uh, sort of you know, go down smoothly on the palate of the fans. Oh boy, is that gross? Is that really gross? <laughs> Trying to use alliteration there. I mean, you know, you used to joke about, oh, good job on the tunnel screen there, Jimbo. Loss of six yards, way to go. The loss of six yards. They, they, they never got it. Yet. They never completed. <laughs> I mean, that's more or less base offense for them. I feel like that's. I mean, but I that's the tunnel. But that was something they didn't run well. Yeah. You know, the tunnel screen. I don't know what the, I don't know why he couldn't teach that concept, but it never it worked two percent of the time, maybe. Um yeah, I think people are it's gonna be people are gonna see, man. It's not anything Florida State fans are really used to. They're just it, it is there is a bit of Mickey Mouse to it. Like we've we've called it that on headlines for years, this kind of offense. It is a kind of Mickey Mouse offense where you you're okay with throwing a screen pass all the way out to the left side to get two yards. And then do it the same exact play to the right side and get four yards. And then you're third and four. And you snap it so quickly that you're hoping, okay, now we're going to run the best running back in America up the middle. He might shimmy out there for 40. And you're just – it's almost like a wear down. Like you want to wear him down because they have to run to the right to make a tackle, all the way back to the left to make a tackle. And then you hope the, so, the, the middle is soft and you can run through it. And you might nickel and dime them to death. You might complete 40 passes for 238 yards. Just – kind of mind-numbing stuff, but you will occasionally break something big. I think that's the that's what you want to do with this offense. And you 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 speed it up so much and you get into a little a rhythm that it just wears teams down. That sounds Maybe, good, right? Yeah. That sounds good. But it's that not it's not aesthetically pleasing all the time. Not everybody it's not fun always to watch a 3-yard pass to a, uh, a wide it's receiver not. out wide. Yeah. It can get kind of I've watched one of those offenses for a whole year. One of those like uh, air mummy offenses. When I was in Valdosta, Chris Hatcher was the coach. Air and raid. It gets kind of air raid. It's like, oh man, it's not really an air raid. It's just a bunch of two yard passes. Yeah. I don't think this. I think this one has a lot more downfield concepts. And to be honest, they, they were, threw a lot yeah. of bombs today they did. or last yesterday and completed a few. DJ had one for a long touchdown. Terry. Weirdly, these <laughs> seems like these guys can play a little bit. Maybe they could have been on the field last year, but they do throw it downfield a lot too. But they do just swing it nickel and dime it to the sideline a lot. DJ Matthews did look good. Yeah, man. I f- and I feel like maybe people maybe want to peg Nooney as that kind of guy, but I I don't I think DJ Matthews is uniquely talented for that sort of role in this offense in yeah. terms of that guy just whoever like put Keith in front of him or whoever they're going to put Jonathan Vickers in front of him. Yeah, they're they going to put a tight end, right? They do Vickers all that sort or, of bunch formation, yeah. stack formation stuff. So if you if put you a get, guy, if you can get him one block yeah. and he's one-on-one with somebody else, man, he can go a long way. And then when they were running the ball successfully, and again they're not ha- they're not in pads and it's it's kind of shell stuff, but there was a lot of big runs by the running backs too. Uh, up, I mean, just you know between the tackle kind of stuff like that you were kind of mentioning yeah. or hinting towards where uh, those things will get softened up. So yeah, I mean at the end of the day, it might not be you know the Picasso professional stuff that we're all used to, but if it's effective and it's scoring six rather than three. I think most everybody will take it. So uh, let's take a final break of the day when we come back. Uh, we'll talk more about spring football and uh, dabble into a little bit more conversation about uh, basketball. Again, Sweet 16 tonight, Florida State taking on Gonzaga. He's Corey Amazon. We're coming right back after this. You're locked in to Wake Up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. This was this was suggested by a poster on Warchant after oh, the right. horrible horrible David Ledbetter analogy I did about holding on to a baby bird. Oh yeah, hold on. Yeah, so, don't yeah. let go. Yeah, yeah there, there you go. go. Makes a little more sense. Shout out to uh, for that recommendation. He's Corey Maslon's Wake Up Warchant right here on ESPN 97.9 Tallahassee brought to you by 
for the table hospitality. And there are three locations over in the College Town District, Central, Madison Social, and Township. Go on and check them out tonight, perhaps, as you watch the Knowles take on Gonzaga in the Sweet 16. I think that's on TBS, if I'm not mistaken, too. So You'll find Check it. your local listings. Yeah. All right, back to football real quickly as we uh, wind things down. We'll get into basketball. we got to make predictions, right? Sure. Then we've got to make yeah. a prediction and kind of things of that nature. So back to the, the fun and the, the camaraderie and all that kind of stuff. You know, you mentioned that in the video that we did the stand-up about, you know, Mike sounded, it might look a little corny. They had like a, a, a mid-afternoon dance break, and then they all shook hands like a Little League football team afterwards. Yeah. And I don't know. I used to have such a romantical view of football, right? Until a buddy of mine actually romantical. Yeah, I like, like made it. it up. I like it. That's a good word. That should be the word. All right, but then my because you know he played for Bobby Bowden, and I was I'm like you know what, what does Bobby say to you guys before like a big Florida game? I'm like you know how awesome is it, like when Bobby's he's like well actually well yeah you know and then eighties the eighties and nineties yeah. you got in a cool so like he ring. chopped it all down and then I you know. So, like, when you actually talk to a guy who's played the game, who's in the locker room, and you you, you, you kind of lose the, the, the curtains pulled behind you, the, yeah. the curtains away, so you kind of lose that, you know, listen, you can go out there and the the emotions of everything can carry you through a game. But it does feel, and it makes total sense to me, and, you know, I, I don't want to be the guy that was, you know, you got to be a, a jerk like, you know, Jimbo to, to be successful. Just I, I don't focus on guys like Pete Carroll or Dabo when I think about success. I think about Belichick. I think about right. Saban. But it does make sense when you think about this is not a team that was devoid of talent. This is a talented team, but they probably were not playing with the greatest effort, and they weren't playing for each other. You know, the way that Willie and Ira have pointed out them quitting on each other and not uh, playing together as a team, doesn't it just make sense, isn't it, like an A plus B equals C sort of thing? Where, like, listen, if you love each other, like, I mean, if you are the brotherhood, this whole, you know, being close to each other, aren't you going to play that much better than just – Focusing on the process, one play at a time, that stuff more so? If it's fun, if it's a fun um, group to be around, and that includes the coaches, and it feels like a family and not a job. I mean, look, we've all had jobs where there's people there you don't care for. But you you still, if it's a cool job, you still want to go to work, and you might just avoid that person. Kind of like working with Ira. Exactly. God, thank God he's in L.A. But if totally you're... Kidding. I miss you, Ira. If... Um, if you if you go into the office and you like your job, even if there's a couple people you don't get along with, you'll do anything to keep that job and to do well at your job. If you go into the job and you just it's just a grind and it's oh god I got to get up again and you know people are looking for you know you call in sick. That happens even when you're not sick. I mean I just when you enjoy the people you're around and you really feel a connection to those people, you don't want to let them down. I, I just think that's. And I, I did not get the impression at all over the last three seasons, really going back to 2014, to be honest with you, they just had a, a, a phenom at quarterback. I never got the impression that those kids cared about letting each other down. I, I just didn't. I, I think that, and you want to build that. I think for whatever reason, Pete Carroll is a great person to use. He built that at USC somehow. He got all these five-star kids and these kids that were going to the NFL that were all rivals, top 100 guys, to really buy into what he was doing. And they had a lot of fun doing it. And he didn't care who watched practice. And Dabo's done it at Clemson. There are ways to do it that's not Sabian, um, Sabian-esque. And so I, I, I think this can work. I do. I just think it's a good way to build a culture of guys that care for each other, and they're not just using this university. And they're all trying to get to the NFL. We get it. I'm not naive. But it's not just using this university as a stepping stone. They actually want to be here and play with their teammates and win games because it's fun to do. Quarterbacks. What did you think about the quarterbacks? Um, Hockman didn't impress me, I'll be honest. But, I, you know, it's a first day. And I don't know how much time he ran with the ones last year or ran with the twos. He was, I think it looked like he was running mainly with the twos from right. what we saw. So he doesn't get – I mean, they don't have many, honestly, many wide receivers out there. So yeah. he's not – He's not getting to use the best Except one. 41. Who's 41? 41? I don't remember his name, but he must have caught 42 passes. <laughs> yeah. It was nuts. Um, so uh, so I didn't think he looked over – I didn't think he looked great. Uh, I thought Blackman looked pretty sharp. And Francois moved around a little bit better than I thought he would and actually participated some. Yeah, I wasn't the ball, So anything. that was a good thing. That's a really good thing. And I think 
I, I saw James throwing some really nice passes. When they went vertical one-on-one, nobody was hitting any passes, and they weren't letting DeAndre do that. DeAndre was doing more. I mean, the one pass he had to Terry that he tipped to himself that we tweeted out, that was probably the most zip he put on any ball. I don't think yeah. – because I mean, you, you throw a lot with your lower body, obviously, right. so I don't think they want to put a lot of stress on him by, by stretching down the field. But I saw some – some bounce back in DeAndre just in terms of him going after James, James throwing a good pass, and then DeAndre kind of stepping in there, clapping his hand, give me the ball, let's go. And you got to be good. I mean, that that only helps. It might be weird between them two. I don't know if they're friends and if that's going to make it odd to have this kind of competition, but that only helps the football team to have two guys that could start and are truly in a quarterback competition. And I agree with you, too. Um, yeah, Hawkman didn't do anything that, that, you know, stood out. I mean, he had a couple – you know, fumbles on exchanges, but nothing well, that's major. Good. That stood out. <laughs> um, but I mean, we'll see. Time will tell. But it, it just feels like you know, it's James Blackman's to lose. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's going too much on a limb or not, or just stating the yeah, obvious. I mean, but I it feels like it's his job. To a, lose. He's certainly got a leg up because he's healthy right now and he can go through everything. Still doesn't. He still looks 160. It is crazy, pounds. folks. How skinny he's gained 12 pounds according to Taggart, but he's got another 120 to go. <laughs> I mean, he is skinny. He's still throwing good passes, though, so that's a good thing. All right, uh, last night, Florida State defeated UCF. 13-3. to three. Uh, They're one four in a row now. 18-4 and four is a nice win. Uh, Durr hit a, one off the scoreboard, and Mendoza hit one 400-something feet. Crushed it. Uh, sloppy game on it. Uh, UCF walked a ton of guys, and I think Florida State scored four runs, one inning on one hit, and scored three runs inning on another on one hit, which is kind of what they do. All right, we'll but yeah, that. good win, good win, nice win. Uh, only one pitcher pitched poorly, and that was Kobe Johnson. He faced three batters, didn't get anybody out. But then Scalaro came in and struck out the side with the bases loaded, all looking. He's kind and the game of, was still in doubt. He's uh, Kobe, kind of had yeah. A they rough need him to find here. himself again because he can be a real important piece to this. But if he can't, I mean, I wonder if it's a location thing or if it's his velo. Because no, his velo is ninety two. Was he low ninety still? So that was it. And then uh, yeah, we got the big big hoops game tonight. Uh, also, yeah, Florida State baseball will, will take on North Carolina this weekend, in case you folks are wondering, up in Chapel Hill. But, yes, uh, to the to the basketball game. Gonzaga taking on Florida State, 10-15. Los Angeles, California, Staples Center, Irish O'Fell will be there. He'll join us on the program tomorrow. Win uh, or lose. Yeah, but hopefully win. Right. So, does it happen, Corey? I'm or, fi- I mean, I'm not going to say – I mean, Gonzaga's going to be favored. Gonzaga's probably the more talented team. They've been there. They've done that. But just – how improbable? I mean, give me like a, a scale of one to ten, just your amazement if we're here tomorrow and we're talking about them living this fight another day. A seven. Uh, I would be surprised, not stunned. Um, I think they they certainly they can beat Gonzaga. They've beaten better teams this year, um, so they can beat that team. But you're also you're playing a team that's got so much. I know a lot. They lost a lot of guys off last year's team, but like uh, like Dallin said, they've got three or four guys that played serious minutes in the national championship game. You can't buy that kind of experience, man. That's just a Sweet 16 game is not going to rattle them. I don't know that they'll get rattled like Xavier got rattled in the final five minutes. I will say to win this game, it's a dumb thing to say, man, just be close. Be within striking distance with five or six minutes left, and maybe something happens. You know, I I, I wouldn't expect Florida State to win this game. I think this is something, it's another step that you build to. You get to a Sweet 16 game, you feel it, and then maybe the next next year, the two years later when you get back, you, you, you can take that next step. Like Gonzaga, frankly, did last year. They had been to so many Elite Eights, it could never take that next step. And then finally they got to a Final Four in a national championship game. I, I think that's I, – I feel like I would be so, – again, long way to answer it. I would be surprised if they won. But if you give yourself a chance, then, man, anything can happen. And if you just go out there and play like you got nothing to lose because you don't, you're not winning a national championship. You can't string together four more great performances, which is what you need. You're not built like that right now. But just enjoy Why the not? moment, man. I mean, I just, I mean, I just, it, it, that, that very rarely happens that a nine seed goes and wins a tournament, wins the tournament. It just, it's, it's hard to do. But if you can just go have fun, enjoy the moment, and give yourself a chance with three, four, five minutes left, anything can happen. Make them go beat you. The one thing that makes me feel a little bit bearish on it, um, as a, as opposed to what about an hour ago, you know, I think Dallin mentioned obviously is that it, this is different than the round of thirty two game because you are rested, you yeah. have more time to prepare, and I don't know how and much Gonzaga f- got an extra day to prepare because they were 
they played Saturday. Yeah. Florida State played Sunday, and Florida State was in the air apparently for seven hours after that game on Sunday night, trying to land in Tallahassee. They didn't land until eight in the morning. Weather was horrible. Yeah, they had to be diverted to Valdosta. They didn't oh. land there. Then they went to Orlando and had to fuel up, and then finally got to Tallahassee oh, at eight in the morning. And then Tuesday morning, they're back on a flight going to L.A. So they, it's been a short turnaround time. I also think that might help them, again, with the whole, let's just, let's just go have fun, man. Let's just go. They haven't had a ton of time to think about it, that they're in the Sweet 16. The pressure maybe that would come with that wouldn't wait on them. Yeah. And they can just go. They know nobody's expecting them to come out of that bracket. Do you have another Clark number that you dropped on us uh, before the Missouri game? You, mem- you mentioned eight three-pointers would kind of be like a magic number for Florida State. Is there? And I think that's what they hit in the Xavier game, I think, was seven or eight. I know yeah. Savoy hit a few, Angola hit a few. Man hit a huge one that got lost, and Kofor hit some. Man, I would say that. if they, Like Dallin said, if they shoot well, they can beat anyone. I will also say if they can somehow force Gonzaga into 14 or 15 turnovers, man, they, they, they have a real shot. Because Florida State turns turnovers into dunks. That, and that's – you're not going to get a ton of great looks against – they're really well coached, man. You're not going to get a ton of great looks in the half court. If you can turn them over and get up tempo, yeah. that that. So I, w- I would say maybe – obviously they got to shoot well. They can't go two of 20 from three. But if they can if they can get Gonzaga up to 15 turnovers, I think they can win, they'll win the game. Sounds good, man. We'll, uh, we'll keep the fingers crossed. Again, we'll talk to Ira tomorrow uh, after, you know, the, the carnage. Hopefully that will be a, a success for Florida State, and uh, we'll break things down. That was carnage bad. <laughs> hey man, the c- carnage of Gonzaga. Gar- Gonzaga's the bulldogs. Spe- uh, yeah, just blood and guts just, of a bulldog everywhere. Oh, I love bulldogs. Well, no, not Gonzaga, though. They're the Zags anyway. Yeah. Um, keep it here if you're listening to the podcast. We're going to go overtime. We'll have Adrian Crawford joining us, giving us his thoughts on the upcoming Sweet 16 game. If you're on the radio, have a great day. Peace Jeff Cameron's coming up at 3. Ah, these recruiting updates are nothing but fluff. Are you wasting your time again on free blogs and social media to get the scoop on FSU recruiting? Yeah, it's all bait and switch. Get me excited with a headline, but get nothing in return. You're on warchant.com. What's really going on with FSU recruiting? Could be another top five class, but for the real scoop, you'll need to get your own Warchant subscription. What's it cost? Free. There's a 30-day trial offer. Just sign up and you'll get full access through signing day. And nobody has more accurate and timely information on recruiting than Warchant.com. You know I like free. Sign me up. Warchant.com, your ultimate seminal source. Welcome back to Wake Up War Chant. We're going overtime today because, man, the Knowles are in the Sweet 16, one of only 16 teams battling for our nation's championship in collegiate basketball. Uh, who better to turn to on a day like this than Florida State's own Adrian Crawford, who joins us now here on Wake Up War Chant. Adrian, thanks for being here, man. How are you? I'm doing well, man. I'm glad to be on today. We're we're glad to have you on, man. I really appreciate you taking time to uh, uh, to join us here and talk about the Knowles taking on Gonzaga tonight in the Sweet 16. I mean, just first off, uh, this little run they're on, uh, th- these two games they've played in Nashville last weekend, um, what have you seen from them that you feel, I guess, uh, maybe not only their identity, but something that's going to be sustainable that they can lean on uh, later tonight as they take on a, a really strong Gonzaga team from the West Coast Conference? I think there's a couple of things. I think one, defensively, I think that when this team is guarding, and I think that that's all predicated, I think, first of all, with the ball pressure of Trent Forrest and what he's done. I think Trent Forrest has been tremendous over the last month. Um, over the last month, I think he's been incredible. I also think that, you know, also with the bigs, I mean, Kamazi, Phil Cobra. So I think defensively, they are in a good space. I also would think as well is that when this team is moving the ball, it's been the thing that I've said from day one, is that when this ball is turning from side to side with this group, that they get some things done and they get some things accomplished. And so I think that their ball movement, their team play is really going to help them. This team has, you know, you, you talked about Trent. You know, Trent has arguably been the best player on this team for the last two weeks or so, but he, he's coming off the bench, but it, it really hasn't obviously uh, prevented them from advancing in this tournament. Uh, the fact that they do go so deep, the, the 10 or 11 guys they roll with, uh, to you, is that something that was a reason they were able to pull away from, you know, Missouri in the first half and then ultimately the game and then with Xavier uh, last weekend in the second half? Or is it tough to get into think- a rhythm when you're running that many bodies out there? No, I think you can because I think depending on how you're playing, I, they we have been picking up full court. We've been pressing. And when you're playing that way and you're playing hard, at this level you're going to need those reps and those repetitions. And I think Coach Han's been doing this a long time. And one of the great things that he's done is he learns how to leave guys in 
and let him stay in rhythm. Um, you know, he'll leave Terrence Mann in a little bit longer. He'll leave C.J. Walker in a little bit longer. He just knows how to do it, and he has good assistance to kind of help him manage it. But I think that this is an advantage of theirs. Their length is an advantage. I think everything else um, that they do there. Um, you know, their team plays an advantage. So I think the 10 or 11 actually really helps them. Now, for them, it, it's I guess protecting the three-point line has been the biggest bugaboo for them. Uh, do you feel like if they're able to – you know, contain I guess Gonzaga from from beyond the arc, and they obviously have a, a you know two or three guys who had Dallin Cuff from ESPN kind of point out the fact that they have uh, numerous bigs that can step out behind the line and knock down shots. Is that the key for them ultimately defensively is to limit Gonzaga's ability to get good looks from the perimeter? Um, I yes, I think so, and I think that what we have to do is do uh, really it's the sports state principle. We've got to make them shoot over contested hands. The other thing that we've got to do. Is um is I think that on our assignments we've got to really be very talkative. I mean, great defensive teams are the most talkative teams, and I think because of how they have bigs who can step out, but we have size. What we'll do is we'll probably switch a lot of screens. Which what you could see is maybe not a lot. Chris Kamadi, Ike Obiagu. You'll probably see a lot of uh, Fiondu Kamengeli, a lot of Phil Cover four or five kind of that way. Just because when they have bigs that can step out. You know, they're mobile, and so, again, I put the, uh, our seven-footers in a little difficult spot. But, again, if we make them shoot over contested hands, I think that's important. I also think one of the things that's going to be key in this game is I think we're going to have to mix up defenses. I think we can't just play man the entire game. I think we're going to have to go to a little three-quarter quarter trap, at times maybe drop to a zone in moments. Um, but, again, we'll see because I think if you keep them off balance, that's where I think we can be effective. And, and turning Gonzaga over, I guess, will obviously be a key because they're a little loose with the ball, as, as we heard earlier on in the program. Is that these sort of uh, the variations of defense that they're throwing out there? Is that what you ultimately hope to accomplish if you're Leonard Hamilton and the, and the Florida State Seminoles there tonight is actually turn over Gonzaga and then get running out on the floor, which is, it seems to be your best offensive option of late? Yeah, I think so. I think that we are in a great half-court basketball team, um, especially right now. We just haven't been shooting the ball great, but... Again, we, you're right. We have to turn them over. We're going to win tonight. We have to turn them over. We have to get transition. And I think that is predicated on ball pressure. Um, it's predicated on the fact that of us denying getting a passing lane. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think that that's going to be key for us to get up and down the floor. And I think the other thing, too, is that when they score, we've got to get the ball out and get it up the floor. We have to constantly keep running. We don't really need to walk the ball up a lot against them because, again, our depth and our athleticism is our advantage um, in games like this. How different is this week? Is week two of the tournament compared to playing, you know, the back end game on uh, Saturday night or, or Sunday? I mean, I guess the, the rhythm that you have in that second game of, of a weekend is different. Everybody's kind of tired and um, cramming in the, the study sessions and the film work that they have to get ready for. But with with this sort of you know week to, to get ready, I mean, how much more different is the second round of the tournament? Do you feel uh, just in terms of preparation and, and matchups and what you can and, and can't do? Um, I think it's a little bit like um, kind of like an NBA season. You know, you're kind of like you're you have quick turnarounds. Again, I know that like you know the team flew back late late Sunday night, I believe, and they got there. They were off on Monday and had probably watched a little film on Monday night, and then they were on a plane Tuesday. So I mean, you're studying, you're there. So I think what you have to realize is that it's going to be a lot more mental than it is really as physical. Um, I think that the usually in tournament games like this. It takes you a little bit of time, especially a team like Florida State who hasn't been in the Sweet 16. Um, it's going to be more eyes watching, uh, more media there than there was even in the first round of 64. And so I think it's going to, you know, at the beginning of the game, these guys are going to have to get their legs underneath them. And so that's why I think the start is so important. When this team starts well, we're really good. The problem has been the, over the last month, we just haven't started well. And so I think that that's going to be really, really crucial in this game. You know, I know you mentioned so many keys of the game, obviously, but Friday morning, if Florida State fans wake up and they have a smile on their face, what do you think will be the one or two things that they'll ultimately be talking about that will be uh, maybe the deciding factor or the separating sort of uh, edge that would have allowed Florida State to have beat Gonzaga? I think if Florida State, in the course of a 40-minute ball game, can get between 250 to 300 passes, as crazy of a stat as that sound, I think we win um, because that means we're moving the ball. We are just really good offensively when the ball's going from side to side. I think the other thing is this, is I think that we have to get transition baskets. I think if we can outscore them in transition, I think that we have a chance of winning. You know, and again, and controlling the backboard as well. So I think really, man, we got to move the ball, passing, I think transition, 
and then I think winning uh, the the battle in the glass. If we can do those three things. I think we win. I like it. Adrian, I feel much more confident now about the game than I did like 10 <laughs> minutes ago. So I hope, I hope everybody else at home feels the same way too. So I feel good about it now, man. Uh, well, I appreciate it. I do. I think that I think this group, what, what you can't, and these are things you can't judge by a stat sheet, is that this group's ability to fight together. You know, I have the privilege of serving as a character coach for this group, and I've got to watch them and be behind, the, be behind closed doors on a lot of different things. And this group really loves each other. Uh, this group's really a family. And it kind of started last year. You know, they had a team motto to our last breath. And and that's kind of really for them. They want to be friends and family and be together to their last breath on this earth. And so this group really plays together. And I think that's what you saw the other night. Even that heated kind of moment in the half time, in the timeout was really those guys saying, hey, we got a challenge, you know, someone to get back and get back involved and help us get going. And, and this guy fights. So you can't put a number on that, on what these guys have together. And so I just think this group's special. And so I'm, I was going to say this right now. It wouldn't shock me if we, if we win these two games. And it's cold out right now in Tallahassee. Los Angeles is a lot better place to be right now, boys. So stay out there as long as you possibly can. <laughs> Cal, hey, like Willie Tagger said, Cali is a great place to visit. Indeed, indeed. Adrian Crawford, <laughs> thanks so much for your time, man. Uh, hope you have fun watching the game tonight. Hopefully uh, we have something nice to talk about on Friday. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care, Adrian. That's Adrian Crawford, former Florida State standout for the basketball team. Also, as he said, character coach for the Knowles. That's a wrap on Wake Up War Chant and our overtime segment. Have a great day, folks. We'll talk to you later.